Hello everyone, welcome to the Great Calls presentation where we showcase some fantastic interpretations made by our radiologists. My name is Scott Baginski, I'm a cardiothoracic radiologist and an associate medical director with VRAD. This presentation is accredited for AMA category 1 CME. I have no disclosures. We're going to be looking at uh, the importance of maintaining a standard search pattern when reviewing images, and we'll also learn how secondary signs can be used to identify fractures. This great call is one of Dr. Chris Garcia's. This patient is a 28-year-old female who is five days postpartum and presents with left flank pain. So this is a non-contrast abdomen and pelvis CT a CT stone study, and we'll run it one more time. All right, let's check out the findings. The patient has non-obstructing left nephrolithiasis with a single left renal calculus and no left hydronephrosis. If we track the left ureter, we see no left hydroureter and no left ureteral calculus. However, we see infiltration of the left retroperitoneal fat with uh, ill definition of the left psoas margin. We see that this finding can be followed into the pelvis. And additionally, there is enlargement of the left iliacus muscle. Progressing more caudally, we see fluid within the presacral space, and farther caudal into the pelvis, the left piriformis muscle is abnormally enlarged, asymmetric compared to that of the right. Again, presacral fluid. So it turns out that all of those findings are secondary findings to the true problem, which can only be seen on the bone windows. So here's axial soft tissue windows and axial bone windows. Let's zoom in on the sacrum. And if you compare left to right, this is S1, the uh, right S1 sacral ala appears intact. There is an extremely subtle lucency of the left one sacral ala here and here. Now let's look at the coronal reformats. Perhaps you can see it. If not, we can zoom in. And then we can put a blue arrow on it. And there is your oblique, non-displaced left sacral stress fracture, which Dr. Garcia spotted as the cause of all that retroperitoneal edema and hematoma. So pretty subtle, to say the least. Here's the very zoomed in image, and you can see there's that non-displaced left sacral postpartum stress fracture. So excellent call, Dr. Garcia. And that fracture was the cause of the diffuse edema and hematoma tracking along the left retroperitoneum, uh, causing the left flank pain. So great call, Chris, on this postpartum sacral stress fracture. This is a pretty rare entity. A review published a month ago found only 34 cases of this in the literature. Many of those cases are diagnosed with MRI, uh, as many are occult on CT. Presuming that the underlying bone is normal, this would be considered a fatigue fracture rather than an insufficiency fracture uh, in the setting of osteoporotic bone. And this is a nice example of using your secondary signs to hone in on a subtle non-displaced fracture. This next great call comes courtesy of Dr. Jonathan Lee. Dr. Lee made a great call on this non-contrast chest CT. Uh, the indication here was chest pain. So we're looking at the mediastinal windows, non-contrast axial images. You can look at those again and see if you can spot what Dr. Lee spotted. All right, let's take a look at the lung windows a few times. And the lung windows again. All right, should be obvious. Just kidding. 
here's the lung windows. Let's dispense with this. The, the left upper lobe uh, demonstrates an area of ground glass and some consolidative opacity uh, medially, but otherwise the lung windows uh, were unremarkable. Uh, this case demonstrates the importance of sticking to a search pattern. If your pulmonary arteries are on your search pattern, whether it's a non-contrast CT or a contrast CT, uh, then you've got a chance at spotting the finding here. If not, then you have no chance. Uh, within the main pulmonary artery, you will see some very subtle linear high attenuation material here at the main pulmonary artery bifurcation. If we look down at the right lower lobe pulmonary artery here, again, it's heterogeneous. So some higher attenuation material, some lower attenuation areas. Similarly, at the left lower lobe, higher attenuation material among some lower attenuation areas. Let's put it in liver windows, see if that accentuates it a little better. There we go. So, again, within the right lower lobe, we have heterogeneous attenuation, areas of high attenuation, low attenuation, left lower lobe main pulmonary artery, I'm sorry, left lower lobe bar pulmonary artery, higher attenuation material amongst low attenuation material. And again, if we go back up to the uh, bifurcation, you can see this uh, linear material here. So Dr. Lee put it all together and said, this patient has a very large amount of acute pulmonary arterial embolism um, and that that ground glass and consolidative opacity in the left upper lobe was a pulmonary infarction. So the patient went on to a VQ scan because they couldn't get intravenous contrast for a CTPA. And that is displayed here. So this is uh, the normal eight projections of the perfusion examination uh, along the top two rows. So uh, these are the perfusion images and then the ventilation examination and a posterior projection is along the bottom row here. So if we start with the ventilation uh, examination, it's a posterior image. So this is the left lung, this is the right lung. Other than the left lung demonstrating relative diffusely increased radio tracer activity compared to the right there aren't any focal defects within uh, either lung on the ventilation uh, study, either within the inspiration uh, phase or during the equilibrium phase. Um, uh, during the washout period, you see there are some areas of air trapping here within the left lung, but otherwise fairly unremarkable. If we compare the posterior uh, projection of the perfusion study, which is this one, uh, with the ventilation study, and we'll see that there are numerous defects uh, in perfusion of the left lower lobe uh, base, large defects here, also at the right lower lobe base, the right lower lobe superior segment, and then the right upper lobe apex. If you look at all of the other uh, perfusion projections, you see numerous uh, large and moderate peripheral segmental defects. Uh, so this examination would be read as high probability if you're reading it via the PIOPET2 or modified PIOPET2 criteria. Uh, if you use a trinary system, you would call this PE present. That would be your conclusion. Uh, but we already knew that, right? Because Dr. Lee called the acute pulmonary arterial embolism on this non-contrast CT. So great call, Dr. Lee. Uh, the te teaching point here, uh, stick to your search pattern. Uh, another teaching point is that you can see acute PE on non-contrast CT sometimes, uh, and sometimes it is quite subtle. Uh, do not let our ER colleagues know that this is possible because we will never see another contrast-enhanced CTPA in our lives. Uh, just kidding. So good job, Dr. Lee. This next great call comes from Dr. Kay Lozano. Kay made a great call on this hip x-ray. So we have frontal and cross-table lateral views of the left hip, patient status post, left total hip arthroplasty. And we're examining the hardware. Uh, we're looking for periprosthetic fractures, evidence of motion, erosions, dislocation. Uh, let's see if you see what Dr. Lozano saw. So if we examine the femoral neck component relative to the acetabulum here, normally this is centered right in the middle and uh, of the acetabular cup. 
and you can see that it is off-center, uh, where it's a little superiorly directed here, uh, similarly here. Additionally, you normally see a portion of the femoral head component, the metallic portion. Uh, you can see it here on the cross table lateral, but it's absent on the frontal view. Uh, if we get the prior, so the image on the right is the immediate post-op image. You can see what, how the prosthesis looked uh, back then. Clearly the soft tissue gas is normal immediately post-op, but notice the femoral head component here, it's sticking out, and the neck component is uh, nice and centered uh, relative to the acetabular cup, uh, which is different than our current study here on the left. So Dr. Lozano noticed one more finding on this examination, and that is if you take the current exam and you window it down, you see that there is this perfectly round, lucent structure flanked by blue arrows in the soft tissues, uh, superior to the greater trochanter. And that is the displaced arthroplasty polyethylene liner, which goes inside the acetabular cup, which uh, got knocked out of there and is now hanging out in the soft tissues. And Dr. Lozano uh, noticed that, uh, talked to the surgeon. Uh, the surgeon took the patient to the OR and confirmed that's exactly what happened. Uh, so great call, Dr. Lozano, on recognizing this uh, complication of total hip arthroplasty of a displaced arthroplasty liner, a uh, pretty subtle finding on this hip x-ray. Good job, Katie. Our next great call comes courtesy of Dr. Lawrence Kaler. On, so good job, Dr. Kaler, on this non-contrast head CT. It's probably one of the most common examinations that we interpret. Uh, so these are axial images of a non-contrast head CT. I'll run through that a couple times. See if you can spot what Dr. Kaler spotted. A patient with altered mental status comes to the ER. And I will direct your attention to the left parietal lobe which demonstrates a small area of hypotenuation of the white matter, uh, as well as a region of sulcal effacement in the left parietal lobe. So a patient with altered mental status coming to the ED, you see this first thought would be that, oh, well, this must be an acute infarction, but Dr. Kaler spotted something else. Note this region of attenuation that's similar to cortex, and it seems to be within the sulci here, and it also courses down to the periventricular region on the left. So Dr. Kaler said, I don't think this is an infarction. This could be something else. Let's get a head CT. They didn't have a CTA. But they had a thick slice head CT, and this is a MIP reconstruction of those thick slices. But it shows us what we need to see, and that is this serpiginous enhancing vessel extending from the left periventricular uh, region out to the left cerebral convexity and the parietal lobe with uh, additional smaller enhancing vessels around it. And again, that mild hypotenuation of uh, the adjacent white matter. This is a coronal reformat showing the same findings. And Dr. Kaler correctly identified this as an arteriovenous malformation. So great call, Dr. Kaler. The teaching point here is that not all white matter hypotenuation in the ER is an acute infarction, uh, as in this case of an arteriovenous malformation caught on a non-contrast CT. This next great call is one of Dr. Robert Shuley's. He saw a very subtle finding on this three-view wrist x-ray done for the indication of pain. We'll give you some time to look at that. We get a lot of great call of the month submissions for extremely subtle uh, radiographic findings, which are very hard to present on PowerPoint. Uh, they're hard enough to see on the diagnostic monitors. But I did my best on this one. 
So let's look at the lateral view because that's where the money's at. This is a zoomed up lateral view of the wrist and we see dorsal soft tissue swelling overlying the carpus and Dr. Shuley saw a very subtle contour abnormality of the triquetrum and he prospectively called a, an acute triquetral avulsion fracture. Uh, the patient went on to get a CT and sure enough it looks exactly like the x-ray. There's an acute triquetral avulsion fracture, a uh, tiny little fragment there. Uh, here is the axial view. See the same thing. So really nice call off that x-ray. Uh, here's the 3D view showing the fragment. So the teaching point here is if you are on and you see Robert is also on, you simply ask him to read all your x-rays. Um, no, don't do that. Please don't do that. Uh, actually, the teaching point is use your secondary signs. So we, we definitely see the soft tissue swelling overlying the dorsal carpus and allow that to focus your attention on what underlies that area. Uh, and in this case, it's a very subtle triquetral fracture. So well done, Dr. Shuley, on catching this fracture. Here are some reference articles if you're interested in learning more about the fractures we talked about. And congrats to all the radiologists. Thanks for letting me share your cases with everyone. And thank you everyone for watching.